Welcome back to Inside City Hall, where we're keeping our focus on last night's primary. Joining me now to analyze their preliminary results in the race for mayor and much more, my politics panel, New York One political commentator, Christina Greer, who's a Fordham University professor and a co-host of the FAQ NYC podcast. And joining us as he does every Wednesday, New York One political commentator, Herson Guerrero. Uh, thank you both for being here. Let me start with you, Christina Greer. Uh, what was the biggest uh, surprise that you encountered uh, last night of all of the numbers that you saw? Uh, maybe the fact that Ray McGuire and Sean Donovan uh, spent quite a bit of money and, and they didn't break the double digits. I actually was also a little surprised that Scott Stringer didn't break double digits. I know the allegations definitely damaged his campaign in the latter weeks, but I was pretty stunned at uh, how quickly people uh, abandoned him. Um, Eric Adams is has a astounding lead right now. I know we still have to wait for absentee and affidavit ballots to come in. Uh, one of the extra surprises was that, that quite long speech he gave last night that uh, reminded me of a victory speech. Um, we still have quite a few ballots to count, so I would not uh, do a victory lap just yet until everything comes in, even though it looks quite good for Eric Adams. Okay, Person, what were the, uh, the, the main takeaways for you? Well, some of the people that actually stayed on the stage that didn't belong, I congratulate Abdul Yang for realizing immediately that he didn't belong on the stage. And I criticized him from the beginning, not only I, others on this program and other places realized that he wasn't ready for prime time in New York City. Uh, except that Bradley Tusk, who described him as an empty vessel, and I'm glad that Dr. Greer used it yesterday in some of the comments she made late last night after the long speech by Eric Adams. But clearly, Errol, if you recall to the beginning of this campaign, when Ruencito Diaz bailed out, and I said, be careful Puerto Ricans and Latinos who vote, because you can't blame blacks, because Eric Adams could be the next mayor. If you go back to some of those tapes, you'll realize that I had a feeling, it, you know, Eric didn't just happen. He didn't just parachute onto this, you know, this big stage of, of the five boroughs. He's been wanting this, working this. You know that's been a goal. As a matter of fact, there were times that we saw some of us, I'll admit, some of us ridiculed his chances. And yet here he was. And, you know, white shirt and in taking it all in, so I can't blame him. He did talk a lot, and I did manage to talk to him today. I spoke to Curtis Thiewell last night. I congratulate both of them. And New York City, we're in for a ride because these dudes know how to get into a ring and, you know, just mess it up. They, they, they're going to take pokes at each other like and punches like you haven't seen. I think it's good that uh, they presented both New York City with a clear alternative. Uh, some of it, we're not going to like the fact that we don't like the personality of, of, of Curtis Thiewell, but the fact that he is duly elected by a legitimate party, a minority party, but he's going to make some noise. We know how much noise and fights he and I had. Sometimes I just wanted to reach over and punch him in the 30, the 13 years that we actually did the segment. So, look, I think the voters have spoken. I think that Eric Adams is headed to be the official nominee. I don't care how many votes they count. Uh, I was looking at some of the articles, at least 55 to 60 percent of the uncounted votes, the identity ballots, uh, have to be uh, gotten by both Miss Wiley and Miss Garcia. I doubt they could do that. Eric had some of that. So I think he's the eventual nominee. We'll have to wait it out. Right, right, right. And um, uh, Mr. Tina Greer, I mean, I, I looked at a little bit of uh, s some of the findings by an advocacy group, uh, and it, it looked um, pretty convincing. They looked at hundreds of cases of, uh, of ranked choice voting elections, and they can only find 15 instances out of more than 200 where somebody who wasn't the first place finisher ended up prevailing in the end. So, yes, it's not over, but the odds are very strongly with Eric Adams. Right, and I think that was the, the sense that Eric Adams had last night, and that's what spawned, I thought, was a, a really unique uh, victory speech, or whatever the speech was last night, a congratulatory Eric Adams speech that he gave, largely because, you know, he said certain things that made total sense for for those of us who understand New York City politics, why someone would have Eric Adams on their ballot, as well as Maya Wiley and Catherine Garcia. You know, he starts off saying Black Lives Matter, unequivocally so, and then pivots to uh, it can't just be with police, it has to be, you know, with black on black crime, which is a very sort of white conservative, black conservative talking point. You know, he talks about social media and, you know, a jab at young journalists, but then pivots to those on social security. If you look at the maps that are out there today, there's, there's no, um, 
there's no mystery as to why he was the front runner and how he remained the front runner. I mean, he went to places where he honestly didn't have any competition. He's almost non-existent in Manhattan in, in particular places, but that's where Scott Stringer, Catherine Garcia, and Maya Wiley were duking it out. Mm -hmm. In Gentrified Brooklyn, he's almost non-existent. Why? Because that's Sean Donovan, Maya Wiley, and Catherine Garcia. But in places way out in Brooklyn, way out in Queens, way out in the Bronx, where quite honestly many of those candidates really didn't put down roots. Eric Adams was there. And so when he's talking about communities that were ignored during COVID, that didn't have the proper language um, information from the mayor's office or anyone in the city to educate them and keep them abreast of what was going on, this makes sense. He's putting together a 21st century coalition that's slightly different from David Dinkins' beautiful mosaic, but it's filled with working class folks, uh, homeowners, yes. people in the outer boroughs, immigrants. Um, you can't say that he doesn't have a coalition and you can't say that he doesn't have supporters because as Harrison said, you know, his supporters know that he will take off the gloves and have a brass knuckles fight with anyone who, who disagrees with certain policies that he's going to push forward right. for his constituents. And I think that, that explains the numbers we saw last well, night. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting because if you look at the uh, point by point at the actual uh, transformation of the NYPD that Eric Adams has, has called for, uh, in some ways it's not all that radical. You know, he wants to reconstitute the gun unit, he's going to have um, some community input on who selects precinct commanders, um, you know, he's going to appoint, he said, the first woman as the, the NYPD commissioner. These are, these are good things, obviously, but uh, they're not going to turn the department upside down. Um, and and um, Herson Barrera, well, I just talked with uh, Alvin Bragg, who's on course to perhaps be the next Manhattan district attorney. He's got a very different approach to uh, dealing with the uh, current crime and disorder compared with Eric Adams. One wonders if we're going to start seeing some fights within government about the right uh, path to take. If those fights happen to benefit the majority of New Yorkers and not the privileged, I'm, I'm listening to him, and the more I listen to him, I'm saying, yeah, yeah, bring it, bring it on. I think that we need people, courageous people, knowledgeable people, people with credentials that are not just going to promise things, they're going to actually be elected and come and bring change. Change doesn't happen from outside, it happens from within. You know that very well, so does Dr. Greer. The majority of your viewers understand, who are uh, the majority of civil servants, a lot of them in government, they realize that it's been wrong for a long time and the justice system the pendulum is always against people of color. I'm glad this man is actually thinking straight that it hasn't gone to his cabeza and that he's turned into a loco and now he's going to accommodate people. No, if you got elected with a promise of change, bring it on. Do it. Right, All power to you, man. Make the changes. I don't care who gets it hurt. And the people who don't want to work with you, let them say adios and bring in the new people that will help you make the changes that will bring equal justice to the majority of the people in Manhattan. Right. Uh, I got less than, uh, I got only about 30 seconds, uh, Christina Greer, but um, to the extent that you looked at any of the city council races, did anything stand out to you as far as um, victories, non-victories, trends? Well, the fact that Bill Perkins was uh, possibly re-elected, I know that, that that District 9 race is still there, and I, I, I have lots of thoughts on that, and that's a whole other show. Um, District 35 with Crystal Hudson possibly becoming the first black female uh, lesbian in city council, which is a historic uh, a win for the, the borough of Brooklyn and, and her campaign. So I'm excited to see whether or not uh, she's able to cross the finish line. Those were the two races that I, I, I was keeping in mind. And also Gail Brewer. You know, I, I think Gail Brewer is a fantastic public servant. I do have some concerns about the Democratic Party not stepping aside Absolutely. and having young people come up and, and start a new crop of, of public service. Okay, those are many more we will be looking at in the future. Thank you both for joining me. That's going to do it for tonight's show. Thanks so much for watching and have a good evening. We'll see you next time inside City Hall.